So last presentation before your lunch. Um, so my name is uh, Patrice Kako, and I'm working at, um, at ING. And ING is, is a bank, but a bank with... Uh, I need to turn it on. A bank with a CEO who recently declared publicly to journalists that he wants to transform it into a tech company with a banking license. And that is much more interesting for a, a technical guy like me. Just uh, a classic background about me. Uh, details are not important. Just be aware that I'm working on integration for the last 20 years now. I have been through uh, ADFact, X12, Tralacom, SGML, XML, and finally today, REST uh, APIs. This, this talk is called a journey because when I started one year ago as an architect in a bank who has to deliver guidelines uh, about API versioning, I had no clue that I will end up in advocating the, the unification of the implementation of things like Canary Release, Confidence Check, and, and why not uh, A-B testing. Alors, let's, let's really start this uh, presentation by the why. Why API versioning, why Canary Release are important? They are important because there is a tension. There is a tension between the API provider on one side and the API consumer on the other side. The API producer, as soon as they have a new brilliant ID, they want to change their API. And on the other hand, the API consumer, they want the API they use to stay stable, uh, as long as they are not interested by this uh, new brilliant ID, of course. Talking about API versioning, changing of API, I can't uh, avoid uh, the recommendation of Roy Fielding, the father of, of REST, about API versioning, which is don't. Um, that's, that's nice. I kind of agree of it, but it's, it's a bit too short. I mean, I have to deliver guidelines in a bank when I just go to the, the, the squats and say don't. It's, it's a bit short, so I will try to, uh, to complement uh, that don't a bit. And, and, how, and along the way to complement that, there is this nice thing which happens, which is this, this canary who wants to, uh, to release that, that tension. So canary release is, is a technique in order to introduce the, the change uh, gradually to a subset of your user before affecting all your... Um, uh, your customer, and it's a technique which is coming from the uh, from the miner. That when they they go down to the mine, they would bring a canary a canary in a cage because if there is something wrong, some some leakage of of gases, it will kill the canary before the miners. So that's a kind of the early warning we are looking for. Um, how does it work on, on an IT system? So you have an application calling an instance of a service exposing an API through a router. I will go into uh, more details shortly. And you have a new version of this service. And first, you do not route any request to it. And then you gradually expose the request to uh, this new version more and more. And at the end, you can decommission the old version. And the nice thing about this technique is that all along the way, if you have a problem, the rollback strategy is, is fairly easy. You just roll back to the former version, fix the problem, and you can, you can restart. And that's this kind, that's the detail of, of this technique that um, I would like to, to talk about today. But first, uh, learning from, uh, from experience, before I continue, I need to pause a bit and to talk about vocabulary and methodology. I need that we share a common understanding about uh, APIs. And, and we have really suffered uh, a lot about that at ING. So one of the first things I have done is this idea of a meta model and a terminology. And to start with, there is the most important thing is that I will try to be extremely clear and to never confuse between the API being only the interface and the service, which is the software package which is implementing it. And by the way, uh, there is something not really nice for me, is that with all the presentation that you will, uh, you will see during those two days, you will probably not remember uh, 
a lot of things about my presentation, maybe nothing at all. So let me take a chance right now that if you have to remind one and only one thing about this presentation, it's this. Make a radical distinction between the API and the service. Thank you. So I have promised to uh, make a 20-minute talk, so I will, I will continue a bit. Um, the, the real Atom is not really the API, but it's what we call the API endpoint. When you write a program, you do not call an API, but you call an API endpoint. And then the API is just a set of APIs that sh uh, the, of API endpoints sorry, that shares the same purpose. Then you have the uh, API specification, the, the swagger, which documents the different API endpoints of the API. And then you have the service that, as we say, implement uh, some API endpoints. This service is really your, your piece of code that, that you version, uh, of course. And we even have a last terminology that this, this service version, when it's instantiated, when it runs into a, a process, when it runs on a, a serverless uh, cloud platform, we call it an instance, which is the things which is actually listening to an IP address and a TCP port. And now, I can talk about versioning. Where is the version? And there is an easy answer. The code is, is version. But the trick is that that's not enough. We have a second version, which is the version of the API specification. And we need to manage the two versions independently, because you might change the service without the need to change the specification of the API, and you might fix a typo in your API documentation that does not require a change into your software. And for these two uh, versions, we are using the, uh, the classic semantic versioning that you should all be familiar with, uh, the major, minor, patch, major, major that you change when you do an incompatible way, minor with compatible way, and patch with uh, compatible bug fixing. The interesting thing about the uh, semantic uh, versioning specification is that it clearly mentioned that you must have an, an API, but they are rather generic about what the API is. They just say that it should be precise and comprehensive. And in our specific world of web APIs, we have a very easy way to be precise and comprehensive, which is to use uh, Swagger. Alors, using the semantic versioning for the, the Swagger itself uh, does not really apply directly to the uh, uh, semantic versioning specification. You have to tweak it a bit, and don't look at that. This is way too much text. But let's just highlight two things that, as I said, the, the patch version of the, the respective artifacts are independent, and the minor version of the service is following the one of the, uh, of the API. So we have our meta model. Now, I just need to give you uh, uh, some hints about some of our components of our um, API platform. So we have an API gateway, which is kind of classic, but we also have an API service discovery that might be less uh, classic for, for you. The API gateway, easy. We still have an inside and an outside, inside the network of ING, outside of ING, and we put a gateway in between. But we also defied divide the internal part into the uh, data centers one and the office, which is the network uh, zone uh, where the, the browser is running on a laptop employee. And we also put a gateway here. And we call those gateway the API gateway on the external edge and the API gateway on the uh, internal edge. And my colleague can tell you that I'm really picky to call it API on the internal edge and not the internal gateway. Why? Because inside, inside the data center, we do not have uh, anything. When you have a service calling another service through this API, there is no middleware, no load balancer, no HA proxy, no bus, nothing. Just a pure TCP direct connectivity. And in order to support that, because we still want logical addressing, we still want load balancing, we have an API service discovery. And the way it works is that as soon as an instance of a service exposing an API is starting, it registers to the API service discovery, meaning that it gives 
its physical address together with the list of API endpoints it implements. So when an application is coming, I would say the, the router part of the application, it questions the API service discovery. He wants an endpoint, which is the uh, logical name. He receives the address, and he can call in a direct manner. And for the load balancing, if you have a second instance coming, it registers to the API service discovery. This um, API service discovery application is refreshed on a constant basis. And when it's refreshed, it gets the second instance, and it can do a load. So this is working a bit like DNS is, is working on the, on the internet. One important thing here is that this, this router I have moved it from being an external component to being part of uh, the application. And this is really something that we are trying to, uh, to do at, at ING, that we try to promote the client-side load balancing and, and not having a, a classic load balancer. And personally, I, I really like it. Um, and that can be a, a subject on its own, so I need to, to be uh, to be short on this one, but just to give you a hint why I do like it, lo look at this situation, which is kind of a, a two equivalent situation, where on one hand you have a client site load balancing, and on the other hand you have a server site load balancing. Now imagine that we complexify that situation like this, and, and you can even in your mind over complexify it. What has happened? What is the difference? On one hand, with the server site load balancing, you, you see that you have increased the charge of your load balancer. And if, if your system becomes more and more complex, this might be a bottleneck. So you have to be very careful managing the capacity of that starting clue to clustering, monitoring closely, and so on. On the other hand, you have to do nothing. Naturally, by design, the load of this balancing is distributed amongst all the nodes of, of your system. I put you as a, as a reference this, this nice uh, article with which I have uh, discovered this idea of a, a client side load balancing. So, API Gateway, Service Discovery, our meta model. Let's construct a bit more on our meta model. The service and the API endpoints are two separate things, but they are linked. And we want to control that link. We want to know which service is implementing which API endpoints. And we do that by a structure that we call the manifest. And one of the tricks that we will use in our uh, routing for Canary release is that at the moment you say that this service is implementing this endpoint, at that moment your endpoint is documented in a specific version of a Swagger file. And you store that version into the manifest. And just to fix the, the ID, we, you can have this kind of uh, very simple JSON structure. So that's for the manifest. Now on the, on the other side. We, in our system, we say that um, when an application wants to call an API endpoint, it has to declare it in advance. That's what we call the, the subscription. So an application subscribe to one or more API endpoints. And again, at the moment the guy, the developer of the application do that, the API endpoint is documented into a specific version of the Swagger. And we store that information. Again, you can put that into a, a JSON structure. And, and, and by the way, as a, as a physicist, I like invariants. You can see that you have almost uh, the same structure. Now, we have about all the ingredients I need to, to tell the, the complete story, but just uh, to warn you uh, a bit. So we have an application which subscribes to an API endpoint when it's described by a certain version. You have the service which is implemented at the same moment. They can, of course, the application can, of course, call the API. Then a new version of the API uh, comes, implemented into a new service. If it's a backward compatible change, the application can still call it. And I, I do agree that then the goal for is to remove the old one as soon as possible. But I can tell you that within uh, 
a big organization saying that the canary release should take one day is, is not something you can really, really force. So you have to be careful that you might have a new application coming that will, of course, be directed to uh, the new service, but that has to be directed only to the new service, because you can't have a request from the application which has been built uh, with the version Y plus one calling the service Y, because it might end up in not finding what he wants. So let's go through with the API registry, the API service discovery, the manifest, the subscription uh, which is implemented into the, the peer tokens. Uh, let's see how we can combine all that together. We start with an API that's even restricted to an API endpoint. So this is an API endpoint. This API endpoint is uh, part of a swagger of a specific version, 1.0.3. And that information goes to the API registry. Now, this is just the API. Yeah? There is just the swagger, no code. Now we have a developer who makes some codes. He creates a service. In order to uh, tell that his service is implementing this endpoint, it means that he includes into his code this famous manifest. So that this service can call this endpoint. And you see that I store the fact that at the moment the service is created, the API specification version is of version 1.0.3. We start an instance of that service. What does he do? it goes to the API service discovery. What does it give to the API service discovery? It gives his physical address together with the list of endpoints he has, which is the manifest. So those information are now into the API service discovery. Now comes an application who wants to call the endpoint. First thing that the application has to do is to subscribe. The subscription is the list of endpoints it can uh, call. And again, we store the version uh, of the swagger, which is documented this API endpoint at the moment the subscription is done. Now, we start the, uh, uh, an instance of the application. We have the router component. Again, it can be inside uh, the code, but it can also be outside the code. We still have an API gateway for the calls coming from the outside of, of ING. What does the router do? It goes to the API service registry in order to get the peer token, which is the list of API endpoints this application can call. For each endpoint you have here, it calls the API service discovery, and he retrieves the physical address of those endpoints. And here, what you do see is that the API specification version match, so the router can actually redirect uh, the call to this instance. Now comes a new version, a new service, a new instance, which register. Then if, we, if the router refresh information coming from the API service discovery, it has the new instance. It's a backward compatible one. We can start to balance the load between. If we, take, if we keep that situation and we have a new application coming with a new subscription, this time to the new version of the Swagger, when it will boot, it will go to the API registry, get this peer token, go to the API service dis discovery, get the exact same response, but this time it can take the clever decision not to root to the 1.0.3, but only to root to the other one. And then you have the complete picture of the Canary release. And I think it's time to sum up. Yes. So summary, explicit distinction between API endpoint and service, <laughs> semantic versioning for both, um, use uh, the manifest, the API service discovery, the peer token, manifest peer token, same structure. You can combine those information to make intelligent uh, routing decision. Last call, please make a radical distinction between API endpoint and services. And regarding API versioning, don't bother your customer with it. <laughs>
Thank you.